republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, justice for all. Thank you to all four of you who came this evening. Uh, Ms. McDonald is excused. Mr. Harrington is excused. Please join me in a moment of silence for Michael Bach, a graduate of the North Syracuse Central School District. Thank you very much. Presentations, Food Service Appreciation Week. Rather semi-lengthy proclamation. The North Syracuse Central School District Food Service staff have contributed to the health and educational development of our, of our district's children by making nutritious breakfasts and lunches that help improve grades, increase attention, reduce absence and tardy rates, and improve behavior. The food service staff continue to make positive changes in order to provide nutritional meals that meet the dietary guidelines for Americans and are a dedicated group of professionals. To honor the food service staff of the North Syracuse Central School District and their accomplishments on behalf of the children who attend our schools, I, Michael Shoes, the president of the Board of Education of the North Syracuse Central School District, on behalf of the board, express our deepest gratitude and proclaim the week of October 1st through October 5th, 2018 as Food Service Appreciation Week to be celebrated with appropriate educational activities. Recommended board action declare the week of October 1st through 5th as Food Service Appreciation Week to be celebrated with appropriate educational activities. Is there such a motion? Mr. Maurizio, Ms. Scanlon, all in favor? There's no one from food service here, but on behalf of the food yeah, service yeah. organization, I'd like to just uh, thank the board. Stephanie's here. I, I know that, but she's busy cleaning up. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> she's <laughs> she's cleaning up after all of us. But, yeah. but, but thank you. Uh, okay. on behalf Good of thing. Us. Yeah, we lay it to Wendy and tell her. We do appreciate everything, everything they do. Thank you. And that punch is awesome, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I, I <laughs> got done. I stole some more. If we can get this thing to work, I'll get the next item up. Here we go. 2018-19 Consolidated Federal Grants Presentation, Ms. Wolchinski. This is um, title, former title, I should say. They're now asking us to call them ESSA, the Office of ESSA, which is Every Student Succeeds Act. So um, I still probably call it title because it's easier to remember that way but the um, office is now ESSA. So this year for the first time um, we now have uh, nine of our 11 schools qualifying as Title I. Um, we've increased steadily over time as you can see. Um, we had seven last year, we have nine this year. I, my estimation in good faith, CNS has always been in there when you look at the trends that come into it. Um, but because uh, many students don't declare um, at that age, then um, I think it has made it more difficult. So I, I would assume that it is higher than 31%. Anything over 30%, 30 and 30, 30 and above, is considered um, a title school. And so we have some that are just right on the border, like Lakeshore came on for the first time this year. How this works is you take a look at the highest, which is Roxboro, Roxboro Road Elementary at 71%. Um, and then you take the money and you go from there. We treat all of our schools in title um, as if they need help, because all of them do but more emphasis would be on those that hold something higher. So for instance, Roxborough Road has a higher need than Lakeshore. It doesn't um, mean that they don't get some assistance at Lakeshore. We, um, at this point, are these numbers, if you look at Wendy's numbers, these come from the state. They were pre-populated in the consolidated application. 
they don't quite match exactly what Wendy has on file. So, for instance, CNS probably wouldn't have made it with Wendy, but with the state, they did qualify at 31%. It, right now, this is what we have as far as um, our academic intervention service people. Um, and nothing has changed on this slide. These were the number of people we've had for a very long time. The difference is included on here would be like Cicero Elementary, um, who is not a title school, but which is not a title school, which all this means is they still have AIS service providers, but the grant doesn't pay them. So um, they're out of general fund. That's the in them. Um, but just so you see, this is our overall staffing that we have. We would love to increase increase this down the road, but right now this is have to serve our students in their AIS that we hope to replace. Title one this year, um, we were giving given the one million total one million three hundred forty seven seven hundred ninety six thousand, um, and we have to estimate what we're going to do with that. Remember in the title schools that we have, we have nine. We also have the two parochial that have to be covered by Title I. So I supervise them in their AIS as well as they share in the costs that come to us. So they also share in this one million three. There are 20 private and parochial schools that our students attend and we have to share, ex share title money with all of those um, buildings if they can prove to us that they have students who, one, are residents of ours, two, are free and reduced, or in their circumstances, something. Or, and they also have to have where they show um, there's a need. So on some kind of assessment, they've indicated that the student academic support. So out of those 20, our two parochials and one other from Syracuse City qualified. The others did not qualify for academic for any um, money at this point in time. The only thing that parochials and privates can have are Title I, Title II, and um, Title IV, which I'll get to in a minute. So we do share with them, and in there is their professional salaries. So the person that they hire as a consultant, I have to visit with them monthly to make sure that they're on track with um, servicing the students that are of need in the parochials. And so their money is included in this, all based on per pupil allocation, which again, the state pre-populated, which was wonderful about the application process this year, it was pre-populated. Title I also has some stipulations where we have to set aside certain amount of money for the, the, those listed above. And one of the things is Title I, we can transfer money from Title IIA to Title I, which is our transferability option, to cover, and in our circumstance, it covers one of our AIS providers. We take the money out of two to cover so that that takes off the pressure on, on the general fund. Out of Title IIA, you'll see in the next slide, we move over to Title I money to do that. We also have two mandates. One is to support students in temporary housing. And you would know it when we um, say homeless students. We like temporary housing better than homeless, um, and so does the state. So we have to set aside a certain percentage, and the minimum is 100 per student. Last year, um, we had 150 students, so we set aside that amount of money for this year. Um, and that has come with a whole bunch of other things that we can do for students um, forever. It's not just for educating them, but it can be for things that they need, such as school supplies or support those students. And so I work with Donna Marie. Um, there's a need there. And the other that's mandated is 1% of our 1,300,000 
47 or whatever the number was exactly on this previous slide, we have to take 1% of that and set that aside for parent involvement. So nine of our schools plus the two parochials have money to spend on the parent involvement and they have to do something to educate our parents. This year, the consolidated application was completely revamped and for this year alone, um, the stipulations are pretty high about what they can do with parents or not with parents and it can't be something that is just bringing them in and enjoying and celebrating. It actually has to be about educating the parents. So all of those nine buildings are submitting proposals of how they want to use that money and then we'll take a look at how they want to use and allocate from there. So Title I um, really helps, I think Don said it the best, it really helps um, support all of the things that we probably wouldn't be able to afford through our general fund because of the money. So up here is a list of all of the interventions that we use or the focus areas that we have within our Vision 2020. And all of, those air, all of these things are our intervention programs. We had a guru from HMH, which is um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, um, come and take a look at our data. And what we noticed in our data is we've made great growth over about the two and a half years we've had some of these into play. However, we could make a lot more growth with the fidelity if we stuck to the program as is and intervened at the tier three intervention level. So all of those programs listed in the first six bullets, um, well, in system 44 as well, are areas that we are going to use with fidelity this year. Don has been so helpful in helping us to finish. These are K-12 programs now, and our AIS providers will be asked to remain within these programs to give our tier three interventions with fidelity to our students to intervene at a younger age, meaning we've moved system 44 that is in the past been at the fifth, sixth, seventh level, we've now moved it to the third grade level. And that is a program that is the 44 sounds of the English language, there are 26 letters, but there's 44 sounds. And if we can get that phonological um, awareness, sooner, then we're not going to see, as we found a 10th grader sitting up at the high school who cannot read right now, who has never had an IEP and has never been identified for anything, has had great strategies and made it this far, but unfortunately, we want him to be a reader and she's sitting up there right now without that support. So we're gonna put her on System 44 and get her that before she graduates. Those are the interventions that we're trying to put into play and we're very fortunate to have Title I money to support those initiatives. Title IIA is around um, recruiting quality teachers and principals and preparing everyone with PD. This is the first year that Title IIA gave us focus areas. We didn't get to say what we wanted to do with the money unless we qualified why. They pretty much gave us about 10 different areas <coughs> for us to spend the money in and we chose those areas. So for instance, one is to support our PLC work. So you know that our teachers are working data and looking at the professional um, development of that within the building and getting them to understand that when we test kids on System 44 or I read or I read one and whatever and we're getting that data back, what do we do with it? How do we support kids? So we wrote that in. We wrote in, um, we have APPR, as you know, and there's an opportunity for principals to remain, um, you know, highly qualified by offering them professional development. We wrote in um, things like um, the mental health and awareness for kids. Um, that was important to us. So um, Lisa got a part of this to work with those schools that have that. We put in for Rocks Middle, we have a TOSA on special assignment right now, a teacher on special assignment, and she's working with Donna Ryder. This is an opportunity to offer teachers more time to work with Donna Ryder or more time to work with other professionals that we feel um, we can support through this money. So it's an opportunity to do that. There's not as much money in Title 2A as there is in Title 1, and you can see in 10 
our parochials get to share in this money, so they also um, benefit by this. And we also always invite them to come into our professional development with, with us without cost to them. We feel that it's um, the community, they're our kids as well, and we have a nice relationship with them to do those kinds of things. See here that it's not a lot of money, but that $250,000 will um, pay our teachers to do extra things in the professional development area or pay for substitute a speaker or we want to do something. Title IV is brand new this year. This is new to us and the first time that we've ever applied. In this one, you can see what it's all about. Um, it's for the well-rounded education um, to improve learning conditions and for technology uses. So out of those three, we had to pick an area. We did not choose technology as we feel that we have something already started in that. Don's working on that, um, has the smart school money. We felt that that at this point in time was pretty um, supported. We really felt like the well-rounded education and the conditions were our areas of focus. And so as you know, we have Lisa Goldberg who heads that um, SEL, social emotional learning um, for our district. And she doesn't have a budget really per se. She, we've had to go to Don and Don has been very kind and generous to cover like our Donna Ryder who done trauma informed education or ACEs, which is about conditions kids come to us with, with and what do we do to support them in the classrooms or our behavior management systems, getting those processes and procedures. And so Lisa's whole focus has been this. And now Lindsay um, uh, Maloney has also been a branch of Lisa in, at Rocks Middle, um, as you know. And so this um, particular grant um, is $96,160. Again, we have to share this with the parochials, which we have, and they had to identify an area as well of where they would put their money. And it seems to always be around mental health is where people seem to be um, focusing their money. So Lisa has a nice um, budget to work with, and Donna Ryder among others, um, but Donna Ryder has been a big focus for us, offering our staff to get some um, tier, again, it's tiered just like, so it's multi-tiered um, systems of support, it's called MTSS, that this part is, and Donna Ryder has been really um, a big support for us, educating us about how to reach those students doesn't have to be an, a student who's been through trauma. There's all kinds of things that happen, but Donna has been a foundation for all of us to learn from and to put some systems and processes into our schools so that we are equipped to help any child that presents with. <coughs> so I don't know if you have any questions. We have one. I think you may have, you may have addressed it on the third slide. Uh, one showing the FTEs. Yes. Reference Gillette Road. But they're not a Title I school, but they have the equivalence. Is that a population thing? It is. You did state that those are not funded into any of the. Correct. They're funded out of general funds. They have just a higher population account. That was inherited when I got here. This has stayed the same. And we've talked about taking a look at the needs of the building possibly switching around um, some staff. However, we're in this um, whole new um, learning. Our professional learning communities that are now taking a look at data that are yes, into classrooms rather than pulling them out. So if we do that model to help students, no matter where they're at, to differentiate the instruction, we're finding that to pull them away than you think because although they may present on state data as a two, um, it doesn't mean that there aren't other kids who got a three. Out being pulled out, they can support all of those learners. So we're, I think we're in a process of trying to learn more about that and how we're, we're operating and I, I'm guessing, guessing, I'm, estimating that in about two to three years we'll be able to take 
look at that with the data we have and are we populated the, the way we should be with the FTEs? Or Dr. Buffalia, the number difference is 1166 at Gillette as far as student population. I knew you were going to call me on that because <laughs> you and, shut that on Friday and, and I should have looked it up. And, and ROX is uh, 811, so it's about 355 student difference. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, Don. Um, this title information is very confusing for me. I'm in the financial <laughs> service industry, so when you said fidelity, I'm thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Different one. Right. So anyways, um, it's very interesting to see all the resources available and how you're utilizing them. Um, I'm just curious of the, when you have to share with uh, the mm -hmm. other schools, the parochial schools, and is it just a one-on-one -on -one percentage of splitting the resource funny, or how does that work? So it's by um, per pupil allocation. So for instance, um, our per pupil this year is $511 per kid for title services. And so uh, over at St. Margaret's, they have 12 children that qualified. So 12 times 511, that's what they get to, and they choose to hire a consultant that we agree upon, we have to do a contract with, to service those children during the day. Not our person, but yet it is our person. We have to agree. I have to visit with that person and make sure they're on point. So they hire the person, but you have to um, monitor them and report to the state on how that money was spent. Correct. And when we get audited, I have to have that information so that it's being used properly. Actually, both um, St. Margaret and um, St. Rose um, have the same 12 each. And so and they have to present how they got that number, and we verify and all of that. So. Um, Thank you, and thanks for explaining um, the different resources. Uh, the the one that there's was it forty four different Title four. Yes. Yes. Well, no, yeah. the forty system, four system, system forty four. Oh, system forty four. So, yes. Yes, you might. That might be something you work with parents too, because if kids yes. hear at home, they think that's how it should be. How things are pronounced. So the one I think I missed is I read. So we start I read in K one and two, and then we do system forty, system forty four, and third grade. They're the same thing about the letters and the sounds. Um, don't catch them by grade three. You know the saying that it's an uphill. So we're really trying to put these systems into place, and making sure that our AIS are doing that. Reality, meaning follow the program as is. <coughs> And the school that rocked it the best last year was Roxborough Road Elementary, second grade. Um, they made more than a year's growth with the kids. So we know it works. We just have to get everybody to buy into it and do it. And I think everybody's excited because Don helped us to fund the licenses, and now we've got the people. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I just want to oh, I just want to thank Dawn. Um, it sounds simplistic when she puts all this up, but if anybody's wandered around here for the month of August, <laughs> it's not that simple, and it really takes a good part of the month of August for Dawn to be quite complicated. So I do want to thank her, and I also want to mention there's a Title III grant that has a small. I'm going to put something. Um, we'll submit something in the Friday letter to. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Comments from the audience? Uh, we have none. Next section, uh, board committee reports. Ms. Scamp? Yes. We had our first policy committee meeting of the year last Monday. Um, we had a, um, quite a few people in attendance. We had a small agenda. There was four policies that were reviewed, and they're on tonight's um, board meeting agenda. Um, I think they're all amend and readopt. And we are looking for uh, Mr. LeClaire to identify a new student rep since we lost Lydia um, fr through graduation. And we have our returning um, student that is coming back too. So um, we might be looking for a new parent rep, possibly. 
so all right and our next meeting is when is that October at the end of October 29th thank you Mr. Propalia uh, we have our first legislative meeting scheduled for this Wednesday at 5 five thirty in the large <clears throat> conference room and a draft a draft agenda will be going out I have one here if anybody needs to look at it ahead of time thank you anything else board comments superintendent comments so I have a couple of things um, if you're on the e-blast or the text blast you would have seen today that information was sent out about a meeting we are so excited to finally um, have this on Rocklow, our new director, has kind of love, and she's worked with a couple parents together. It really, I think, will help us um, in our focus area of inclusive education, working with parents in a positive, proactive manner. So, I'm very pleased to say that is is out there and underway. Next thing I have is a really unusual. I just had to bring this to share. So, we got a box the other day and it was this was all wrapped in bubble wrap with a it's a scrapbook that was marked free that this woman's husband found at a yard sale in Cornwall New York the scrapbook belonged to a woman named Lucille May Fox who was the valedictorian of the 1941 graduating class it is fascinating. She has old report cards in here. And Dawn and I, we were looking at this today because we read the Friday letter. We're, we're thinking about studying, maybe moving to trimester report cards in four quarters. So, you know, we've got a, we were saying we've got a long, a long track. Um, Did they use standards-based grading? No, they didn't use standards-based <laughs> grading. But this is fascinating. And I'm going to, you know, if the board, any of the board members want to look at it, it is absolutely amazing. And she graduated when she was only 15 years old. There's all kinds of great information in here. I am particularly interested. I read her, her graduation speech because she was a valedictorian. Thoughts in it that I think I'm going to steal or use. <laughs> I'll give her credit, of course, uh, but to weave into uh, one of my talks as well. But absolutely fascinating. So after we're done looking at it, I think I'm going to send it up to high school because she talks a lot about the war and the economy and things that were happening at that particular point in time. And I'm sure, Carol, that the Social Studies Department would love to get their hands on this. So um, it's, it's, really, cool. it's, really, it's really awesome. And I'm going to send this woman whose husband picked it up from Ms. Lucille um, a thank you note for sending it to her. I know it was for the class of 48 we saw that. Um, I think so. And here's another thing that was interesting. She was only 15, but she stayed on for an extra year, like they allowed people to stay longer after they graduated. So there's even things in here from the class of, of 42. Handwritten notes about picnics and how much the items cost. It's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. So um, I just wanted to share, share that. Hey, routine action items. A, consideration of approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of the Board of Education for September 10th, consideration of the classification and school placement of disabled students certified by the District Committee on Special Education, C, consideration of classification and placement of preschool disabled students certified by the District Committee on Preschool Special Education, and D, Consideration of classification and placement of students in home instruction programs as recommended by the Home Instruction Review Committee. I'll entertain a motion, whoop, if I don't lose this, to approve 5A, B, C, and D as a group. Ms. Kruger, Mr. Fufalia, all in favor? Discussion action. A, recommendation to create teacher on special assignment Instructional Coach for Inclusive Education. Who's going to comment on that? Annette or Jason? Or who's I can comment on it. Um, so as you know, we have eight focus areas with Vision 2020. 
of education being um, probably the first of the eight that we've started studying a few years ago. And we're, we're well on our way, but we still have some things that we need to do. And one of the things that we've decided is that we could really use an extra set of hands and somebody who kind of specializes going in and helping out with differentiation in a number of different classrooms that focus on co-teaching. Um, so we envision that this person will work in classrooms for special education programming as well as probably the English language learners because, as you know, challenges with that as well. So we're recommending a teacher on special assignment, but we have listed this as a one-year position. Mm -hmm. So we'll work with the union to hold that person for a long-term sub and kind of analyze at the end of the year. B, designated gift or the purchase of the scoreboard, and this is uh, Chick-fil-A. Uh, first, first installment of $2,000 for the scoreboard sponsorship contract. C, acknowledgement of gift from the CNS Optimist Club, has donated $2,500 for use at the North Syracuse Early Education Program. And D, some non-marketable and marketable equipment. It appeared to be some computer tables, I believe. Yeah, some uh, some com computer tables that will end up selling, and then uh, broken iPad. Okay. So we'll uh, entertain a motion for six A, B, C, D as a group. Mr. D'Onofrio, Mr. Maurizio, all in favor? And then we've got the four policies. E, policy 4320, students with disabilities under section 504. F, policy 4327, homebound instruction. G, policy 8500, school lunch program. H, policy 9280, in-service program. So entertain a motion for 6 E, F, G, and H, Ms. Scanlon. Second, Mr. Fufalia, all in favor? Carried. Personnel, 7A, instructional personnel. 7B, support staff personnel. Need for any discussion or a motion to approve both? Mr. Maurizio, Mr. D'Onofrio, all in favor. Motion for executive session. Motion to move to executive session for the purpose of receiving an update on negotiations with the North Syracuse Education Association and the middle managers bargaining units to receive an update on one legal matter relative to potential litigation and to review the employment history of five individuals with no action to follow. Motion for executive session, Ms. Kruger, Mr. Thorne, all in favor. We'll go to executive session 737. 